Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Field Notes. Uh, I'm with you today, Joni and uh, Jonathan. And today we're going to talk about some things that, uh, well, throw you a curve. All right. So life can be going along just fine. Have you ever had that happen where everything's just fine? Nothing's going wrong. Everything's fine. And all of a sudden, there's some tragedy or some kind of mischief the devil throws at you that now you have to consider going in a different direction. Mm -hmm. There are uh, plenty of times in my life where I have gone to the Lord uh, for you know specific normal things where you're just asking him for things. And then there's those times where it really depends on, on him doing the work. All right. Uh, let me give you a little story. All right. Uh, my son, is a very bright young man he, he's in college but when he was a little boy um, we were given the, the the news that he had uh hearing loss right and so you know that's kind of a being a dad just doing normal things you know taking him to preschool having a good time you know playing around uh and then he wasn't speaking. He, he couldn't talk. And so we took him to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, he's deaf. That's why he can't talk. And I'm thinking, wow, how is that even possible? Now my whole life is shuddered to think that he's not even going to be able to hear. And for months, we went to specialists, John Tracy Clinic, uh, places where they were trying to help him hear. And finally, it came to the point where prayer um, was the normal part of my life. I would help him, Lord, help him. Uh, and finally, we, we acquiesced to the notion that he's going to have to get hearing aids. And so we were on our way uh, to see the doctor to have him fitted for hearing aids. And at the time, I was going to church at a little church in uh, Lake Forest. And I said, you know what? We're going to stop over and we're going to give the Lord an opportunity to deal with this. So we went in and they laid hands on Austin. And for the next 30 minutes, we were in prayer. So we finally left and we pushed our way to the doctor. And he was at, at the specialist getting ready to do his hearing tests to find out what kind of hearing aids would be best for him. And uh, so they started doing the tests and I could see the doctors going back and forth. He had the doctor has the chart in his hand and he's going back to this guy and going over to the nurse, coming back in, seeing Austin, checking his ears and they're testing his hearing. And finally they concluded there is nothing wrong with his hearing. And he was healed in that instant now he had not heard up to that point and he could not speak up to that point or talk very well and he was diagnosed as having hearing loss up to that point but when we took him to for prayer we asked the lord to do a mirac miraculous thing and god did mm -hmm. and his they they he did not have to have hearing aids and he went to special speech therapist and he learned how to talk, and he could hear just fine. But it was determined in my heart to pray for him, and this isn't going to be the, his end result. And God healed him. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even know that God was going to do it, but we, we knew that his hearing, uh, he needed hearing aids. And then all we knew was he could hear after we had prayed mm -hmm. and had la hands laid on him. And the, you know, that whenever you have a uh, a change in diagnosis, diagnosis as huge as can't hear to he's fine, they have to come up with some kind of a, a uh, answer for it. Yeah, you know what they call it? Intermittent hearing loss. Hmm. So intermittent hearing loss. Yeah, right. So we found out that that God has a funny way of confounding the doctors. And there's examples after examples of where people in very dire situations 
did not take no for an answer from the Lord. In fact, they sought him out in many places in Scripture that said, please come with me. Yeah. Please heal That's right. my daughter, heal my servant. Went and got him. Went to him and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to alter the path of his course today, mm -hmm. and we're going to get him to come and help us. And we have a few examples of that. I wanted to share that story with you because, you know, I, it's evidence that God has a purpose for things that, that go wrong, that he might be glorified in them. That's right. And uh, that's, a, that's an example I live with um, almost to the point of it being normal that God does stuff. So I'll turn that's it over right. to Joni. So. Yeah, I love that story because notice how Jonathan said on the way to the doctor, they stopped. Okay, so John sought Christ. He didn't just go, well, I guess this is it. We're just going to pop some hearing aids in and we'll go on with his life and work around it. Something was at work, faith and believing was at work in Jonathan's heart to go. We're stopping there. And so he went and got Jesus. He went and got him. Okay. And that to me just speaks so tremendously. We were discussing this very thing because this morning when I woke up, I was telling John tearfully, you know, that for the last couple of days, I had just felt empty. Like I wanted to record yesterday, but I said, Jonathan, I just feel empty. Like I'm not doing anything. And I just felt like when I feel like that, when I get to that, I just let it go. Okay. And so this morning I got up and I really wanted to talk to God and I wanted to hear from God. I wanted to hear what he had to say to me and to all of you, because I'm in it with you, okay? I may receive inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but believe me when I tell you, it is just as for me, as much as for you. So with that being said and moving forward, um, I, I, I was in uh, devotion this morning and in the book of Mark, I was reading about J. Iris and that's in Mark chapter five. And I want to say that there were many years ago, you know, I've had a pretty radically rough life, but there was a part in my life where I just thought I couldn't move, go anymore. You know, I just really could not go anymore. It wasn't that I was faithless. It didn't mean that I didn't believe the Lord anymore, but there was something in me that just came to a stop, a grinding halt. And I came upon this story of J. Iris, and I just pulled out some scriptures. You can read chapter five yourself, but there is something Jesus said that to this day has empowered my walk with him. And John's story was an excellent intro to what we're going to discuss today. And starting at verse 22 of Mark five, it says, and behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, Jesus, he fell at his feet and he besought him greatly. I mean, you can just picture him. My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Now, I want to say something because when he, Jairus, being a ruler of the synagogue, back in the day, if you were a ruler of the synagogue, you wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Okay? Like if you, like Nicodemus, when he was visiting Jesus, that was when everybody was sleeping. So he was sneaking out at night for these secret meetings with the Lord. And... Jairus comes out in a crowd because when you're desperate, you're going to be like him because Jairus was ruling his right standing, his high elevated standing in the synagogue. And he was doing it publicly. Like you get to a point where you don't care anymore. Who sees you? If you have no makeup on, if your hair is a mess, your clothes are raggedy, you don't care. If there is something happening in your life, that's at the point of death. You don't care about what you don't care about nothing. Okay. Now notice he says, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Well, between this time 
Jesus agrees to go with them, right? So we know that there was a big crowd that was following Jairus and Jesus and a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years who had sought help from doctors. There was no cure. She spent every last penny on having a cure. And now she's so desperate she says within herself, look, if I just but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. We know that end of that story, right? So she does. She touches the hem of his garment. Jesus feels virtue go out of him. She said she feels in her body she was healed. But you see, in her case, she was like, because, she, you know, back in the day, if you were issuing blood, you were unclean. So you really have to understand that during that day in Mosaic law, any woman that was issuing blood was considered an outcast. She was a social outcast. She was, I mean, do your own research on that. I don't want to focus on that. But you see, when there was nothing left, she didn't care who saw her. She was already at the bottom. You know when that's that saying that says you got nothing left to lose? Right? Like there was nothing left for her to lose. She had lost everything. She had nothing, okay? But Jesus healed her. And now, it, notice, Jesus has already made a commitment to go with Jairus, right? Mm -hmm. And that he's walking with him. And while they're walking by, the lady, notice her stance. She's on the ground trying to crawl on through the, the crowd to get to him with that desperateness in her heart. Desperateness. If I just, if I can just touch him, I'll be okay. But then something happened. As soon as that they paused in the streets... Jairus' servants came out and said, hey, you don't need to bother the master any f further. Your daughter is dead. And as soon as Jesus heard that word was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, don't be afraid, but only believe. And they went on to find, uh, went out to the house and find his daughter, and he laid hands on her, and mm -hmm. what happened? Because of his faith, because of her faith, because of the things that she determined and they determined in their heart that Jesus could heal, that Jesus was the answer, mm -hmm. that Jesus, if we could just get him here, will be okay, it'll be fine. And that's how our hearts are with the Lord now. And if you've ever been in a desperate situation, and I want to say this about desperate situations, they're not by coincidence. God allows us to go through trials in the normal activities of living. Yes, he does. To prove that not only is he our, our, our savior, but he's our deliverer, mm -hmm. he's our healer, yes, and he's interested in our day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. He's interested in the moments that we walk with him and that we seek him out. And he is faithful to deliver on the promise that he will lead us, guide <laughs> us, and care for us mm -hmm. and deliver us from all kinds of troubles. You know, the operative thing that John and I want to now extract out of this is the saying of the servant that came out before Jairus got into his house. He said, trouble not the master any further. That was what the Lord spoke to me many years ago, because you get to a point where something's dead. Something is ended. There's no more hope. There's no more answers. There's no light at the end of the tunnel or hope for light at the end of the tunnel. It's dead. Whatever that is in your life. And that was the point I was at in my life where everything was barren and dead. And when I saw that word from that man that said, trouble not the master any further. You know what? I saw that more as no trouble the master further. Keep going. You trouble him because Jesus basically answered by saying he didn't answer the servant. He came to the person that came for him. He said to Jairus, he didn't look at the servant and say, hey, wait a second. I told him he didn't do that. He looked straight in Jairus' face, say he was the servant. This is how I picture it. And he had just said, you know, if, you know, if I were the person of, right, 
he didn't look at the servant. He looked at Jairus and he said, be, be not, not afraid. afraid. Only, believe. say it, John. Believe. Only believe. And that belief, you know what that, you know what that action plan for belief is? Determining in your mind that what God said is true. And that determining it, it can happen in an instant. But it also happens over a length of time. Mm -hmm. A persistent belief. Persisting through the impossible. Seeing things that are impossible and saying, you know what? God is able to do it. And there are plenty of places in Scripture. And I can tell you in my life where it was all, all was lost and there was no hope. And then God shined on that situation and changed the dynamic, changed the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all about. We're about determining in our heart what to do before the Lord. And he's determined in his heart to see us through it. That's right. So we're here today. Yeah, we're a couple of miracles, actually. We're a couple of miracles yeah. because we troubled the master further. Right. Now, had we not troubled the master any further... I can honestly say I'd be afraid to know where I would be today, okay? But I want to say more about that, about J. Iris, because we look at a man and you picture him, he's leaving his the temple. He's obviously well known in the community. He's with a reputation, right? Powerful reputation. And he goes and gets Jesus. You know why? Because he'd been watching him. And he heard. He had heard the rumors about him. And little by little, one rumor became a true fact. And with every true fact that came along with Jesus being in town, it made his faith and hope rise. And and even with people that were ill around him, he healed more than just the, these, these examples. Everyone who came to him, he healed. Yeah. And we want to focus, though, not on, because there's 37 acts and miracles that Jesus did in the four synoptic gospels. But we want to talk about the deliberate ones where people went and got him, where they got themselves mm -hmm. to him. You know what I'm saying? Not, you know, there's so many different ones, but we want to focus on it because. I, I would bank on the fact that 100 percent of believers, 100 percent have found themselves in a place, and if not, you will find yourself in a place where you are going to be hopeless, where you are going to have your life smashed into smithereens. And everything that you've done, even your own, you know, doing things your way in, in, the, in the Lord, where you, something goes down deep. And I want to talk about that going down deep or that place where J. Iris was and the woman with the issue of blood because they got to the point where they were like boldly proclaiming who they believed in because for them to do even though they're on opposite sides i mean she's a complete social outcast people are looking at her as now she's poverty stricken i mean miserable miserable life okay an untouchable and then you have this celebrity religious leader and they're throwing it all into the arena going, we don't care. I want to be healed. I have a son at home, a daughter at home at the point of death. But Jesus, he went with them. He didn't say no to them. Okay. And as John pointed out, he was in the mix of everybody. Unbeliever and believer. There was no Christians back then. There was just people. He came into his own. He came to the world. And Jesus is among us today. So I want to go just a little bit further, but I want you to keep that saying in your mind, trouble not the master any further. And so what I did is I compiled a list of people who went and went to Jesus. They sought Jesus out who were at the point of complete absolute this is it facing death absolute door slams door slamming all around them no hope from any humanity no hope okay and so we have to begin with 
a certain nobleman's son. You can read about him in John 4, 43 through 54. It says, so Jesus came into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. Okay. Then he said, Jesus said to him, except you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. So you see there again, there again. Do you remember what Jesus said to Jairus? Only do not be afraid. Only believe. Okay. So he's saying, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman said to him, sir, come down or my child is going to die. Right. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and he went his way. And so we know the end of that story that he didn't say any more to him. Like, what do you mean go my way? Why aren't you going to come with me? He just accepted that because Jesus had that reputation and because his faith was active, when Jesus said, go your way, your son will be healed. Your son lives. Mm -hmm. And he went and found out that it was true. You know, I want to share a story that I saw a long time ago. It was a video. It was a CBN video a testimony. And I never forgot it. And it was a woman and she troubled the master further. Okay. Now the story began with the husband because they're together giving their testimony, but you know how they do the, these reenactments, right? So the, the husband's an air force officer. These people in the, you know, officers, all people in military, they're always training physically, right? So one day he just goes out like he normally does and he goes jogging and he realizes he's having a heart attack. Next thing, the wife now takes over the story. And she said, I get a call at home there. My husband was rushed to the hospital. Somebody saw him on the ground. He had suffered a massive heart attack. And she said, I went to the hospital. The doctors told he was completely unconscious. And the doctors told me, um, we want to let you know that the kind of heart attack that your husband had, um, nobody comes out of it. Um, the prognosis was not grim. It was dire. It was call the family in. Um, anybody who's watching this to understand that, you know, you, cause I, I'm not a great cardiologist understanding person, but yeah. I just know that the kind of heart attack she was describing was there's no hope. He's not coming out. He was completely unconscious. Well, she grabbed her Bible and she was there for one whole week. And every single day around the clock, she would put her Bible open on top of his chest and she would find scriptures. First, she would find certain scriptures and she'd go, this is the one. And she would lay it on top of his chest and she'd put her hand on the Bible and she would pray out loud and she would be saying, Lord, and she'd declare that verse over her husband. And she was doing this around the clock. And when she wasn't doing that, she was interceding for him and, and laying hands on him. And she was walking around the room, around his bed, declaring him uh, to be the Lord's and so forth. You can imagine, right? She was potent. And at some point, um, nurses were coming in going, you know, da -da 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 -da, you know, and she was like, no, you don't understand. I am a Christian. I serve the true and living God. I have faith that God's going to bring my husband back. Finally, the doctors, they did an intervention and they came to her one day and they were kind of mad at her. According to her, they were upset with her. They were saying, well, basically, you know, when people are in grief and, you know, they kind of basically they were saying that she was losing her mind because of grief. And she goes, I am not losing my mind because of grief. She said, I am upset that he's like this. She said, and I am not losing my mind. My mind is sharp, but I know my God. And she declared that God, Jesus Christ, was going to raise her husband up. And they said to her, you need to, and they were mean to her. I, remember, I don't remember the exact words, but it was something to the effect where they said, you need to understand your husband suffered a kind of heart attack that can never, his heart will never work again. He will never come out of where he's at. And she said, and they basically said in so many words, 
he's he's done. Okay. Not coming back. He's not coming back. And she said, My God is greater than anything. He is the great physician. And they she said they were mad at him. And she was even ill treated by all the nursing staff. Um, they were mad at her. They they were sick and tired of it. And she wasn't overtly screaming, but she was in there going to town, right? On the seventh day, her husband opened up his eyes. Long story short, he's obviously doing the interview, but the doc, what happened was I, he stayed there a whole week longer, but there was not even a remote shred of evidence that he had suffered a heart attack because she suffered the master further. She troubled the master further. So basically she, she troubled the master further and look what happened. Right. And how many times do I, have I given up? How many times have you given up where if we just pressed in a little harder, a little further, we we've missed out on so many miracles. So our encouragement is to keep pushing, keep asking and don't give up. You know, I'm just going to peel through this. These are some examples of people that troubled the master further. Jesus healed a man full of leprosy. When you were full of leprosy, that means you were at the end stages of mm -hmm. your life. That means you were basically near the gates of death. But he, he, he fell at the feet of Jesus and troubled the master further. Jesus healed a centurion's paralyzed servant in C Capernaum. Okay, he sent his friends and he sent people from the synagogue to trouble the master further. We see that Jesus healed a paralytic who was let down from the roof. There was no room for these four men to bring this paralytic into a crowded room where Jesus was. So they opened up the roof and let him down. And Jesus, seeing their faith, healed the man because they troubled the master further. They didn't take no for an answer. They said, we'll bust up the roof. Um Jesus calmed the storm on a sea when his disciples were in there and they were like, master, don't you care that we perish? I mean, they were screaming this. The water was filling up the boat. It was the middle of the night. They were saying, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus, remember, they troubled the master further. Okay. He was asleep and they knew he was, they troubled him. Don't you care that we perish? Um, Jesus healed many sick in Gennesaret as they touched his garment. All of these sick were blind, lame, crippled from birth, lunatic, epilepsy, all things that no, they, they could not, there was no healing. There was nothing that could help them. But they decided to touch his garment because they decided to trouble the master further. Also, Jesus healed a woman in the crowd, right, with the issue of blood. We got that. Jesus heals a Gentile's woman, demon-possessed daughter. Remember the Syrophoenician mm -hmm. woman? Remember it said she came to his disciples and they were like, you know. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And then, long story short, remember she pressed in and he said, it's not meat for me to give the bread to the uh, dogs. And she said, yeah, well, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. See, she troubled the master further. Jesus also healed a boy with an unclean spirit. Remember the deaf and dumb spirit? Remember the father brought this boy uh, to the disciples and they could not heal them? Heal him. And the father said, remember he cried out, help thou me with my unbelief, right? He pressed in. Why? Because he troubled him further. He pressed in because he knew what Jesus can do. And one more, Jesus restored the sight to blind Bartimaeus and Jericho. We know that there was two blind men, but we know that when Jesus was on his way out of Jericho, blind Bartimaeus heard a crowd going by and he asked what was happening. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they, those that were around him, Try, trying to suppress him. Hey, stop talking. Stop and then he, he spoke even louder. And then he got his, Jesus' attention. Imagine that. Imagine uh, the sound of a crowd and a voice 
over over the top of that crowd crying out your name, Jesus. And he heard him. He stood perfectly still. Can you imagine that? And then it's, somebody came to him and said, uh, be of good cheer, arise, the master calleth for thee. And then Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said that I would receive my sight. You know, think about that. If he would have been silenced when they, they charged him to hold his peace, he could have went. You know, sat down, went back to his iced tea and just let the, the crowd go by. But something stirred in his heart. And that stirring in our heart is the, is the motivation that we determine in our heart that God is true. That's right. And that's what happened in these examples. They believed, they were determined, and they wouldn't take no for an answer. Yeah, because, I mean, when you think about blind Bartimaeus, I mean, Jesus was just in his body like you see us now, right? So he was probably thinking, this is my only chance. He, this is my only chance. That's why he was screaming. It's kind of like, even if he goes probably and doesn't heal me, how am I to know? How am I to know? I got to scream louder. And something, remember, the woman with the issue of blood did it publicly. Jairus, he did it publicly. The man full of leprosy did it publicly. All these people did it publicly. They didn't, you know, they didn't just go to him and timidly go, I don't know if you're thinking about it. I don't know how you feel about it. Um, but I've been, you know, I have this problem. Would you consider, they were like falling down at his feet. Listen, that same man of Galilee is the same man of Galilee in heaven. Okay. And there, there's something I want to talk about going into the depths of yourself. Because when you've gone to the point where it's dead, the thing is dead. There's no hope. It takes you down deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think about Psalm 30, 130. It says, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. But I'm going to go down here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I like this part. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waited for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. And, you know... It's a place that you get to, okay? Because there's so many times when you're at the end of something that you're like, oh, this is it. I, I can't go anymore. But then you go a little more and then you go a little more and you're going lower and lower, deeper and deeper and deeper until you're at the point where you're like, I don't care who hears me. I don't care what I look like. I don't care. This is what your word said. And listen, that is something that is a place, a unique spot of depth inside of you that reaches and grabs a hold and goes and gets Jesus. Just like them, we're an extension of them. And, you know, I, I like that scripture that says, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows have gone over me. And I'm just going to pretty much end with this. You know, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. You know, this is David speaking. He had a terrible life. Really, he did. I mean, he experienced God in no other way. I mean, in ways that most of us will never experience. And he knew God that way. But when he said deep calleth unto deep, see, there's a deep that calls into the deeper places in Christ where Christ resides in us. Okay. And, you know, I had something here that I was going to read. Um, I'm not going to do that, but I think we've made our point clear that whatever's going on in your life and it looks dead, trouble the master further. Go further with him. Right, John? Right. Yeah. We want to go further you, with him. You have to decide. And this is the this is, this is what it takes to be a believer. Faith faith that God is true, that he's going to deliver on what he said he would do, 
and that your circumstances have come into your life, the ones that throw you for a loop, the ones that knock you down, the ones that terrify you, the things that you didn't see coming mm -hmm. that have changed your whole trajectory in life. Those are the moments where God allows them to come into your life so that you can know that he's God, mm. that he knows that he knows you. Even more importantly, he's in your life to make your path uh, complete and that your life in him is complete. And we have plenty of places in our life where we can look back and where things went wrong. And were it not for the fact that God was with us, would have had a total different outcome. So for, for us, our message today is don't give up. Keep the faith. Trouble the master further. Absolutely. And trouble make, him further. Because he's a God who wants to be heard. He's a God that wants to deliver his 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 uh, whole uh, gift to us through Christ is the knowledge of his faithfulness and his mercy. Mm. And healing is a part of that. Healing is a fantastic part of that. And in each one of these examples that we've experienced today were places where people determined to get up and go and get him. So get up, go get him, because he's faithful to deliver he even just asks you, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. So take that as a, a part of your experience. When you meet trials, remember this. Remember what we're talking about today? Because trials are made to, are determined, they're going to happen. And how we respond to them is the difference between sitting down and letting Jesus walk by or getting up and yelling for him and crying out to him because he will hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, listen, we can go a lot longer with this, but sometimes just leaving it where it is and saying, never forget those words, trouble not the master any further. That's basically the Holy Spirit saying, trouble the master further. You want to trouble him further and to him, it's no trouble. You notice how Jesus never showed any signs of it being a trouble for him to go anywhere to somebody's house, whether they were people that loved him or people that did not love him. So know this, that you have to put it out there with the Lord. Okay. Um, and I think basically that's our message to you guys today. So never forget, do not be afraid, only believe. Amen. Okay, and that takes us to our invitation to become a Patreon subscriber. Uh, our PayPal and, and other uh, places, website. the website, are in our description box. Please go out and check out uh, JoniStall.com. And thank you for your faithfulness. We are so happy to be here. And thank you for all that you do. And thank you for trusting the Lord through this in Jesus name. Yes. And make sure, sure you share oh, yes. this video with everybody, you know, and, and subscribe. Yeah. Absolutely. Subscribe. subscribe. Give it a thumbs share. up. And um, we just want you to know this is real, a real pleasure for us to do this and a real privilege. And Jesus is our friend. Don't forget it. He's always our friend. And so. Hello. <laughs> We're your friends too. We love you. All right, you guys, go with the Lord. Have a great day. Shalom.